Benvenuto, Marco, and uh, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure having you here with us today. How are you? All good. Grazie. Grazie, Ole. All, all good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, an amazing day here in Zurich. So the sun is shining uh, and I'm very, very happy. Thank you for inviting me today. Absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure having you here. And I mean, like, Marco, we're going to talk a lot about your experience today, a lot about, you know, uh, your ex your experience with like, you know, working closely with spectators and fans and like your journey in the sport industry, you just going across the globe, essentially. And and it, it's quite a journey. You know, I think it's going to be really interesting for a lot of people here to just, you know, see what you've been part of, uh, getting some insights, getting some tips and and for those of you that are tuning in and, and want to hear, you know, other great advice and, and insights from people like Marco, you know, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, you know, and you get insights every week, every week from people like Marco and, and other sport professionals out there that are providing, you know, some great thoughts, some great insights and helping you find your career or maybe some good insights that can help you wherever you are in your sports career. And, and really appreciate it too, if you can like this video, you know, it's going to help us with the algorithm and all this stuff. So it always, always helps. So I really appreciate that. But Marco, um, we're going to dive right into it. And I wanted to just, you know, know a little bit more about how your journey in the sport industry began. Like take us back to like, your love for sports and and how it all started <laughs> well my love for sports started way before uh starting working in sport and uh, and to be honest uh, i never thought i could work in sport right um basically um the love uh, the love for sports came came from my family yeah. And uh, of course, uh, the, the tradition, uh, uh, the, I, I will not forget the day that my father brought me to the stadium, uh, of course, uh, uh, but not only to, to a football stadium, of course, being Italian, uh, that's, uh, that's the first <laughs> sport usually, but even earlier, um, my uncle used to play basketball professionally, mm -hmm. so we were going to, to see his matches uh, A2. So nice. second division in Italy, and uh, yeah, during the the breaks uh, in between, it wasn't the quarters; there were half time. There were oh, two okay. times. Uh, so basically, as a kid, we would go in the field of play and play and play basketball during <laughs> during half time. This was amazing, and that's what connected me with basketball. It was my first love for the games of sport. Then volleyball. Then uh, I studied in the States, even baseball, American football, uh, ice skating, uh, horseback riding. So really all kinds of sports. And when there was a Olympic on TV for me, it was like, wow, one month uh, I, I have something to do all day long. <laughs> uh, definitely. So um, basically beyond my dreams. Uh, why I got graduated in political science uh, and uh, the, the, the idea was to become a diplomat. Yeah. I wanted to travel for work. Yeah. Not that I'm really a diplomat, then I, then I found that out, so I, uh, I kind of changed my way. And how did I get involved in sports then? Yeah. Um, I was in London uh, during my internship uh, in a hotel oh, okay. and uh, I got injured. For nine days I couldn't, uh, I couldn't work, uh, then mm -hmm. I went to the hospital, they couldn't tell me what I had, so it was, it was an excuse for me to go back home uh, right. for, for a weekend. Yeah. And um, I, I had a quick stop uh, in Torino, uh, mm -hmm. where my best friend, she started uh, working for Torino Olympics. It was uh, September 2005. Got it, got it. And uh, Saturday night, having dinner with her friends from work, uh, basically a Greek girl, Vasya, which I would never thank enough, uh, so something in me, uh, but she didn't ask directly. She asked my best friend, said, do you know someone uh, fluent in English uh, that could be available? Because there's an American company just uh, they're looking for event services manager, basically taking care of the spectators right. within the Olympic venues. Uh, she immediately replied, you have it in front of you. And Vasya <laughs> was texting uh, the HR manager, who was her very good friend. Right. Um, and that night in a pub and uh, i was i wouldn't say let's say i had a few glasses of <laughs> wine a few glasses of limoncello uh, right. i had my pre-interview 
and uh, two weeks later, I was moving from London to Torino. Nice. Uh, then started later in November, but that's how I started with an hernia. That's what I found out also that weekend. I had an hernia on my ad, which is still with me. It's my it's my lucky lucky tool. <laughs> that's awesome. That that's a really. I mean, like it, it's a really incredible story of how how it all turned out and like just how it started, right? And and just like sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time. And I always say this thing, you know, that every everything happens for a reason. And uh, well, well, also as you're gonna talk about a little bit later too, that uh, you know, of course everything happens for a reason, but it's also about grabbing that opportunity when it's there. And that's something that obviously you know you were able to do and took advantage of that. And, uh, and yeah, so it, it's, it, it's quite a, quite a fascinating story. And, and, and I want to go back a little bit, of course, like to when you were younger and, and I know like already as, you know, a 12 year old, you, you went abroad, you know, explore a different system uh, and, and through your professional career, of course, you've been all over the world, you know, uh, including, you know, Brazil, Russia, Qatar, Canada, the UK, among just to name a few, of course. And, and what are some of the key lessons, I guess, you you learned along the way about people? And I guess like especially about the people in the sport industry, because that's essentially, I guess, from Torino where it all started and, and where you are now. You you I guess you've been meeting a lot of people, you've been seeing a lot of stuff. And uh, and and yeah, what are some been of the the things that you've been learning, I guess, about the people in the sport industry? We have five hours, right? Oh, well, yeah. like, <laughs> no, 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 well, because we'll there's just two. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's keep something for for the next time. But yeah, uh, we'll, um, we'll make like follow ups. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah. Ole. But uh, thanks uh, for for the amazing question and uh, people. Uh, how how do I answer that? I have many ways. Uh, uh, probably the first thing that comes to my mind when I say people is um, is something it's one sentence that um, a homeless told me in new york mm. it was 2011 and i just came from london when i had an interview for the olympics so it's related to what to this right. chat it's related to hr and um he, he he basically asked me for something and i i, I gave it to him and uh, and then he looked at me probably um my face, uh, my expression uh, told him something. I, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, it's not the word, it's the people. And he walked away. Wow, it's, it took me a long time to, to, to give, uh, there's many senses that we can give to this sentence. But basically it has to do with that opportunity that I had in Torino. Right. I was definitely lucky absolutely extremely yeah. lucky to be there uh, but someone else uh, might have been uh, like uh, oh i have an hernia no i cannot do anything i shouldn't travel should be. so right. my decision was probably the the less uh, healthy but um, i i wanted uh, what i want to say is uh, um I was the right person probably because I had already some frustration and mm. uh, his sentence is not the word is the people is the people we see nowadays a lot are the same we are the same pro at the same time sorry the problem and the solution right uh, in the world and uh, without going too deep and too much into <laughs> philosophy um, there's um, uh, the, the people that I met in this uh, in this industry uh, in, uh, I've worked in five continents in the last 16 years, right. uh, lived in most of the countries you mentioned, some others. Uh, what I bring with me is uh, the memories that I share with those people from which I've learned. And we, from our generation, we are all kind of disciples of the experience. Yep. We didn't really study uh, sports management as there was no sport management course. I think we were some of the first, probably Coventry University in 1998, they had right. the first master degree in sports management or yep. some others in the same period. So let's say in the 2000, uh, we, we've learned uh, on the ground. So we learned from those that we did mistakes before us, trying to avoid doing the same mistakes. And we learned by our own mistakes. Right. So 
this is what also connects uh, in, in between uh, the professionals in this uh, in this environment probably yeah. and uh, passion above all this is what uh, this is my key lesson learning and the key takeaway from all these people from the greatest people that I've met in this industry they are all driven by a huge passion because believe me uh, um, it is not easy to keep up uh, working in this environment when you grow up of course there's a, it's exciting it's amazing uh, moving from a country to another but then you start having a family then kids and so on so it yeah. starts to be really 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 difficult sorry the sun is, <laughs> no worries. just came I mean, to like, say to say i hi. think you can be glad having sun you know <laughs> <laughs> yes i told you it's a wonderful day so yeah. i'll be moving around as the sun is no, going no, down no but, worries. i mean like yeah uh, I have the same situation like over here because we're not used to sun and and I mean like when that happens I'm like oh my god I gotta gotta be all over the place but but going back to sort of like that you know I guess like the expression of people right and and you talk a lot about like the passion and I think you know the, the, there's a lot of you know people these days especially and I mean like I'm also sort of like part of the younger generation I guess I'm, I mean like I'm starting to get old old too and from like yeah a student student perspective although i'm not student anymore of course but but it's sort of like that you know where a lot of people want to be in sports because of the glamorous side you know sort of like what you see on tv right you're like oh i'm gonna be like you know watching the champions league game or i'm gonna you know uh be walking right next to the player or whatever it is and they think like oh but this is this is the glamorous side of the life. And, and then they don't realize, okay, what exactly is the requirements and, and what is the work that has to be, be put down? And you put it very well because it is an extremely, you know, challenging and demanding industry to be part of. But at the same time, you know, the people that are in there and, and the ones that you met as well, like there's, it's like, they love it. You know, it's like, it's so exciting to just be part of these moments and be part of these stories and and i see it all the time too like me personally as well from from like you know i always sort of like okay i want to work for like a professional football team that was sort of like my my goal too because football has always been like my first first sports love and once i sort of like realized you know with sporting global that I can work with any kind of sports i can i can be part of everything like we can help every sport and, and that's amazing to me because I'm learning so much and I'm meeting, meeting so many great people, including yourself, Marco, that have like such a great experience and, and insights that, you know, that it just showcases like, you know, how are we going to help impacting the industry in this current situation that we're facing, we're, that we're facing right now. So I bet you have a lot of great stories from like people you met, but maybe, maybe we have to do that on a behind the scenes podcast or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely, but but to to, to wrap up uh, on, the, on that answer, the passion, no, the passion of those people, uh, it is also those people that will spot the passion right. in in other people. Yeah. So then is is where the connection uh, is uh, created and is uh, deep. A hundred percent, and I guess like moving on a little bit into. I guess specifically for some of the, you know, major events that you've been part of, such as the Asian Games, the, the Rio Olympics and the World Cup, to name a few, of course. And, and you've been able to obviously recruit a lot of these people in your specific roles. And, and I guess like in that sense, and I, and I mean, like you probably have touched a little bit upon it already with the, with the passion, but what kind of people are you looking for specifically and, and how do you pick them, you know? Uh, I I have uh, I have my personal approach uh, to to selection and recruitment Re recruitment right. of course depending on the level that I'm looking for if uh, if I look for a manager rather than a supervisor or an assistant uh, central team rather than stadium or venue team and so yeah. on uh, to give you an idea first of all about the numbers. Sure. Uh, in terms of people, I do take care of the spectator services uh, or event services, depending on the, how it is called. But overall, the, I would call it the physical experience uh, from the moment uh, uh, that the spectators are approaching the venues or the stadium and backward, because right. is such an important piece of that experience. Yep. Um, in, 
we go from a uh, Winter Olympics uh, in terms of numbers, it's pretty similar to a World Cup. Then World Cups do change uh, depending on the on the country, the amount of host seats, and so on. But right. to give you a rough number, Winter Olympics and World Cup, uh, my area is around three hundred staff. It's wow. up to three hundred staff managing uh, five to six thousand volunteers. Um, then uh, in Summer Olympic, uh, we're talking, we're doubling the numbers. In terms of staff, yep. we are tri tripling the number of volunteers, around 15,000 volunteers, 600 to 700 staff. That's the amount of people involved in the physical fun experience on the ground on match yeah. days or on band days. So how do I approach the selection then? Because uh, you can imagine with such a huge uh, number, uh, of staff and volunteers, you want your message. To, I used to say in the Brazilian World Cup uh, team, where I was at the time lucky uh, to, to to design something that uh, in, the, in FIFA World Cup wasn't done before. Right. Um, so um, I was looking first of all stadium managers. Let's let's focus on that. Sure. Uh, attitude before experience. Mm. I've listed uh, 13 characteristics that I, that I wanted my managers to have for managing around 600 volunteers and around 25 staff each. Right. Uh, so they have to be leaders, of course, and so on. But this might be um, shocking for someone, but uh, I was looking more for the attitude and better if they didn't have lived experience. Why? Because of the glamour. Uh, what you said and because of the glamour uh, professionals th think that this is the greatest environment and it is from a certain perspective of course doesn't mean that there's no challenges doesn't mean that you you don't have to fight for every single penny in right. the budget so they come with expectations I mm. see how it's linked to my job then I need to exceed the expectations of the spectators and to exceed the expectations of my staff first I need to take care of their journey first because those are the ones that will provide that amazing level of service on the ground right. and solve an, an infinite amount of issues anticipating uh, problems so the attitude yeah. first absolutely leaders but at the same time team players mm. because they are leading that team but they are team players within a larger team which is the stadium team right. and my training session to give you an idea first first day i do not talk about spectator experience and services first day is focused i invite the heads of or whoever they send of every other internal stakeholder which are so many that do impact to have an impact Think about ticketing security, but even overlay rather than sustainability and so on. Yeah. Um, basically, I give the first day to them in, in a logical order so that at the end of the day, my message in the debriefing is, guys, I know you're waiting to know what your job is about, but it's more important to know what the other's job is mm -hmm. so that you understand where your area of responsibility and of operations right. and focus should be and who to contact because what we are doing here is gathering an enormous amount of information very complex and we need to process it put it together integrate it among all internal and external stakeholders and then communicate it in a very simple way to the spectators which is at the end of the day that volunteer with the megaphone on an empire chair that goes always on the on the first pages uh, uh, of the on the news uh, 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 during the event, right? Because he's providing, is is igniting that atmosphere as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he's at the same time informing. Take right for the metro. Simple as that. That little message takes years. Yeah. And a huge amount of work to get there. So leaders and team players, and of course, we are talking about taking care of people. And that's a responsibility. There's people that have invested. Uh, if you talk, and I love to talk with the spectators during the event, um, you hear so amazing stories. People that sold the car because they didn't have the money, but it's the World Cup 
and is the country next door to them. And uh, last time it was in the 50s and who knows when they would come back. Right. That, that father sold the car to, to come from Venezuela with his kid right. to watch the, the match. And then you need to be empathetic and think to that kind of level of detail. Of mm. course, um, people with, uh, with mobility issues, people with, uh, 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 who have uh, all, all kinds of needs, you need to get to doubt that detail, put yourself in the shoes of the spectator, because we are all saying. Mm. And this is my message also to, to my teams, usually. Yep. And, uh, and then I delegate to my managers the selection of their supervisors. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you also have to respect the local, uh, you have to trust your team, you empower your team also by giving that responsibility. Right. So this, uh, I think, uh, is pretty much um, uh, roughly, again, uh, what, uh, what I do look uh, in, in my team. And then the central team has other characteristics. I need more project management, I need more communication, I need more people who implement uh, and two uh, are able, they, are cre uh, they have a critical thinking. So they criticize me. I like to be criticized. I like to bring uh, every event to another level. And if I'm always doing the same thing and I say, Marco, you're doing a great job. I think, don't think we, we managed to, to innovate and to improve uh, event after the event. Right, no, but I think it's, uh, you're touching upon, um, how can I say, um, it's more about almost, personality characteristics than anything else right besides you know your background and experience like you're essentially saying like what kind of people represents those kind of assets or capabilities that these these managers you know in this case of course needs in order to one deliver you know at the best possible ability but also you know, portray that image, I guess, to their supervisors, their, you know, the, the people under them as well. And I guess like that trickles down, I guess, in a sense, all the way to the volunteers. And, and I wanted to like, just hear your thoughts a little bit on like, just the volunteers itself too. Sort of like how, like, like, what do you, what do you need from them? Like, what are the, what are some of the stuff that just like, okay, that this is sort of like the, 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 the bench line, I guess, of, of what, what we should expect from, from their side and, and what to have in mind when you're, when you're picking those as well. I know it's like a, a lot of people and you have to like, you know, can't go maybe as much in detail, but, but just, just to give like a taste, I guess, because there's a lot of students, you know, that are maybe listening to this. They're like, oh, a great way to start is being a volunteer, you know, at, at, at an event. And how do I get involved? What do I need? And what are some of the stuff that I should think about? And we will touch a little bit upon that, of course, at the end as well. But just, just briefly, if you could like tap into that now, I think it would be great too. Yeah, absolutely. You touched a very good point. Uh, uh, being Having the opportunity, because it's, it's an opportunity to be a volunteer and to gain experience is quality time, I'm sure. Uh, those volunteers uh, uh, that uh, I had uh, the privilege uh, like to work with a uh, long time ago, more directly on the ground, but now they're still my client. Uh, and to be honest, without the volunteer department, this wouldn't be possible. I mean, I do not take care of the recruitment. I do define the requirements for the volunteers that I have, and I'm the biggest uh, um, client of, the, of that of the volunteers department because uh, in, in a world cup to give you an idea the half more than the half of the volunteers are uh, basically uh, do work uh, for uh, for spectator services uh, yep. and it, it's a huge workforce um so to your question basically the volunteers uh, uh, the opportunity to to gain experience through volunteering is something that i suggest to everyone massive then what do I expect from volunteers? I've learned in Torino, and since then it has been a confirmation, no matter the culture, no matter the country, of course, every country has different approach to volunteering. Yeah. Um, it is more challenging, this is not in the culture uh, in some countries, uh, but then it's, a, it's an event, a, it's a historical event. Uh, so people tend uh, to, to apply by, you know, driven by the curiosity, driven by the, the will to, to be part of something unique that right. is touching their local um, territory, but it's also changing their local uh, 
their local culture, some town yeah. legacy. If we think about the legacy in Barcelona, 1992, uh, it's amazing. So, yeah. and in, in, uh, in other Olympics, of course, as well. Um, what to expect from a volunteer, I've learned it in Torino, is this, they will always exceed my expectations. That's why uh, if, I, if I give them 100% of myself, I'll get back 200, so I stop competing with the volunteers. It's impossible <laughs> to beat them. Uh, seriously, they, they will Amazing. impress you. They're so key. You know. There's people that travel around the world. I had the same volunteer at different events. Uh, he's from Germany, Toby. And hi, Toby, if you're listening. Uh, he's traveling around the world, uh, and I'm very happy to meet him here and there sometimes. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we ended up... Uh, I wasn't lucky, maybe I shouldn't mention, in the sta Olympic Stadium seeing uh, Rome against Bayern Munich, then they, they scored eight goals against us, unfortunately, and he still reminds me from time to time. But th well, this is volunteers, I go around he, the world and should. I have my... Sorry? As he should remind you. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, I would do the same, to be honest. Exactly. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I take around the word uh, the, the letters that I received from the volunteers. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, youth, a volunteer from Curitiba, who is Brazil, mm. who recorded a, a, a video, not, not a video, a voice, his voice reading a message which uh, gives me goosebumps is, is amazing. Uh, what does it mean to be spectator services? And he starts a sentence always with, uh, with a characteristic, always with the S like STS, which was mm. the acronym of the functional area. What does it mean to be STS? So it's, it's a way of living the event. That's, uh, that's his conclusion. Uh, because he's helping the others, he's uh, uh, having the privilege of, uh, of helping the others, uh, which is the spirit of volunteering. Yeah. So this is, this is just amazing. Uh, <laughs> what we're looking for volunteers, uh, they to have a great time. They to pay back their time in making them busy because the worst thing you can do to volunteers is think that, you know, he's a volunteer, I shouldn't ask him to do this. No, 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 they're very, very happy to go the extra That's mile. That's why they're there, you know, they're there to be part of it. And, you know, they would do anything in many cases too to be part of it. And, and yeah, having that opportunity. And I mean, like it goes back to the passion, right? Of just being part of something. And, and maybe it's just, you know, for, helping your country or helping your city or you know it, it, it's a lot of factors i guess why why people volunteer you know it's not just you know sports students and professionals wanting to like you know learn i guess for, from a business standpoint but it's like that you know being part of a community and we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about you know that as well uh, now when you've been obviously, you know, working so closely with, you know, the spectator services for FIFA and, and other events. And, and if you could sort of like define, I guess, like, like how would you define a spectator and a fan and how has sort of like the pandemic uh, affected how these entities, you know, that have been involved in all these events, how should they look at them moving forward? Wow, this is a this is a very deep question, uh, and um, the, thanks for it. I mean, spectator, by definition, is spectating something. So I would I would stick uh, to the semantic, uh, and I would define it as someone who spectates the event. Right. Uh, and this nowadays, uh, and more than ever nowadays, uh, can be done, uh, of course, uh, physically, attending the event in person or yeah. digitally, uh, remote, uh, watching on TV, listening to the radio. Uh, right. Well, uh, it's less spectating in that case, but I mean, uh, it can also be a fan. Right. It can also be a fan, but the spectator profile uh, tells us that, uh, especially in global events, there's, a, there's an attendance of all kinds of people that have very, for, so many reasons they are there they can be the ultimate uh, fan uh, that will uh, that has attended uh, every world cup uh, since uh, he was born right. uh, and i met one of these um uh, from south africa amazing guy awesome. um and then um there's uh, there's the non fan the the wife uh, or the husband that is not interested uh but is curious uh the 
the father that uh, planned uh, the summer trip uh, of the family and uh, because his son is a fan he is not right. like there's so many it's uh, such a variety of uh, uh, we're talking about human beings uh, this is yep. uh, this is the premise to all this no so human beings is amazing because uh, it's uh, we're all different somehow <laughs> and who's a fan uh, they're, they're more um, again this def- different level of, of uh, fandom we could say right but it's someone who I would define it who is emotion emotionally connected mm. as I am with uh, my team yeah, as yeah. Roma <laughs> uh, or or one player uh, Totti yeah. we were we were discussing we're discussing earlier. before before the podcast. <laughs> When Totti left uh, left the game, uh, to be honest, uh, a part of my heart left the game as well. Right. There's nothing I can do uh, unless a uh, new Totti, meaning uh, captain number 10 uh, from Rome, uh, that makes me feel what he made me feel uh, right. will happen. And I don't know if I will see it. Uh, it will happen probably and later. Rather than soon, but so in a sense, what makes you a fan, right? It's sort of like that that connection that you were able to get with not only the club, but also like with that kind of player. And, and, and yeah. So how, how do you sort of like, yeah, let's, let's continue hearing you here. <laughs> the, the, the joint probably, but I'm, I'm thinking this is a kind of brainstorming now because I'm thinking now probably is the joint of several factors. It's not like, of course the colors, uh, if, if they somehow are your favorite or they turn to be your favorite colors, yeah. uh, of course the Jersey of the season, of course, many, many, many factors, but uh, not always. Uh, if you think about my team, not always the result, the sport result. Right. It is more a connection, and as I mentioned before, that is a family tradition, and this is what connects us mm. uh, for for a lifetime. Right. Because uh, wanted or not, um, there's uh, something will happen in our life, and we we'll lose the, the the closest people, unfortunately, and this is this will create will make that connection even stronger right? because you will go back to the stadium and it connects you directly to your beloved one that is not mm. there. So this is why one of the, I don't know, myriad of factors uh, until, and connecting to your question, until something happened like a pandemic, this is a, this is a huge challenge if we stop thinking for a moment because uh, this is not happening. The, the, the parents are not taking the kids to the stadium yeah. And if they are watching it from home, which is in most cases the only option we have, yep. we're watching uh, something that is not really entertaining and engaging. This is my humble opinion. It reminds us that we have a problem because the stadium is empty or seriously, uh, partially empty. Yeah, empty. yeah. It's so this psychologically affects you know, the, the spectator and the fan. So there's studies and polls that tells us that a portion of fans will not go back to the stadium and not as back as the stadium will be reopened. And so there's a lot of work to, to be done indeed uh, at all levels. Right. And, and I mean, like, and that, that's why I wanted to sort of like bring into my next question too, because this sort of pandemic, it, it put, I guess, sports in a, in also a very challenging situation in many ways because of, you know, like with all the, you know, we see it every year too, like of how demanding people have become too in terms of, you know, being part of something and all the possibilities that you have these days, right? Of like being part of some sort of community and and that community feeling and that being part of some something that, you know, spirit is, is extremely powerful and, and feeling unique and attached to something. But with this, and I guess like maybe tying that into sort of like the generation growing up in this sort of pandemic and situation in sports now, um, how do you, where do you sort of like see the spectator and fan priority shift in the next few years? Because we, I think in a sense, we have to separate them, but at the same time, they kind of like are almost getting closer and closer because of the situation. How, how do you, how do you see this? Uh, I, I see it um, um, in, uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, let's, let's start with the premise. Uh, sport um, 
we, uh, to, to be honest, uh, I believe that sport, uh, in many cases, uh, sport organizations didn't understood that their product, sport, is an entertainment option. Right. Uh, this is due to the to the recent uh, development in the last couple of decades. If we think about uh, the, the 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 TV rights and uh, the incredible growth now of some sports, um, so it's related to that probably. Uh, but uh, nowadays, with the situation, uh, the pandemic showed that uh, is is an option uh, among many others. And if we think about the growth of uh, esports, mm. uh, if we think about the growth uh, um, of Netflix, right? That's a, that's a, that's a competitor. Uh, that's how I see it. So uh, where do I see the priorities? Uh, unfortunately, sport um, usually reacts, tends to overreact to historical events. I'm thinking about the reaction uh, in. Um, for, for event organizations uh, uh, related to, to what I know, uh, to 9-11. Right. Of course, uh, the, the strongest uh, need was security. And the huge investment and the huge budget that had been allocated to security since then, I'm, I'm thinking about the, an interview I read to the CEO of Torino, 2006, mm. uh, one year after the, one year after the, um, the games. Yep. They, uh, the journalist asked him, what would you, you do? I said, probably I would save some money on security. Uh, but, but it was so close. It was only five years after 11th of September. So if I relate to that, uh, back uh, to the oligarchism and uh, the way, the, the approach of policing the spectator, no? that mm -hmm. was the reaction, if we think about uh, football again. So what would be the reaction to COVID? Uh, I'm kind of witnessing uh, being involved uh, in some events that are being uh, uh, under that are being organized uh, very very soon. Uh, let's say right. the, the Euro 2020. Um, it is uh, there's there's a reaction, of course. Everyone we want to ensure the opportunity for fans to come back, but given the very uh, the very uh, few case that we have as a reference we are putting a lot of effort in ensuring that is as safe in terms of health as well as possible but this will have a, an impact on the experience because yep. uh, we the, the attendance at an event I used to joke uh, that spectators do need a, a master degree NASA level to attend an event and enjoy it because the amount of rules that are in place that are uh, every every year more of yeah. course have an impact on their experience and if they don't know that they have to access through one precise entrance why they were accustomed to enter whatever they wanted from if they don't know that they cannot take the car but they have to otherwise they'll park two kilometers away etc 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 down to if they don't know that they have to get tested at least, uh, I don't know, 48 hours before, 72, 24, still under discussion, then they have paid for something that they cannot attend, yeah. and so on and so on and so on. So what uh, the challenges here are many, 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 many. Uh, the challenge uh, basically uh, is to keep enhancing the live experience while the complexity is increasing. So our job as sport, let's say managers, mm. uh, it is to simplify the increasing complexity, to keep simplifying somehow, right. ensuring a positive experience uh, and uh, the target is to exceed the expectations always. Yeah, I, I think I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of like just simplifying the process, you know, of like just touching upon that, just to follow up on that too, is it, it's just that you know, I, and I think you made like a very <laughs> great statement in terms of like, oh, you almost need like a master degree in order to like attend an event with all the rules and regulation. And I, th I think that kind of like you, like the beauty of sport is the charm, right? It's like the emotions, right? If like, how do you, you know, bring that and the more you sort of like clutter, I guess the experience, the more chance you sort of like, you lose that charm. You know, in a sense, I, I think, and I think, 
you know, we're so focused on, and I think it's, you know, of course, very important of having, I'm not saying like, of course, we shouldn't have requirements and, and, and a lot of these structures should definitely be in place and is in place because it has to be. But how do you simplify that process to whatever kind of fan that is coming in the door? As you said, you know, at major events, you, you, you met, you know, fans that some who, you know, attended every World Cup and then you met someone who's like, okay, I sold my car to be at this event because I don't know next time what's going to happen, right? Maybe they, and, and people were like a first time visitor. And if these kind of things are too complex, how will that impact, you know, fans traveling and making that decision? And, and I always said sort of like this thing for my, my, myself as well. And, and I mean, like, as, as you are a football, you know, fan, you know, that Norway isn't, you know, the, 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 the top, top nation as, as they are in football, but, but I always said like this thing once, it's once improving. You- it's it's doing well now. Like it's getting there, of course, with Holland and and other good and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of potential. But I, but I said to myself, the, the day we qualify for like you know when we'll be in a in a, in a World Cup or European Cup, I have to go because I don't know next time that that will happen. Like it ha- we haven't been to anyone since you know '98 and and 2000. So it, I never had the chance to experience that. Uh, you know, going there and be, being part of that. I don't even almost remember it because I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old. So it, it's sort of like a way where uh, I said to myself, okay, if that happens, I have to go. And, and now I guess like, you know, this new regulations and the pandemic and sort of like, it, it's so unaware, you know, of like, where are things going? And I guess being able to structuring that out in a very simple way, it's going to help you know, bringing the people back into the stadium and then bringing that atmosphere that we're so focused uh, around. And as you mentioned, is you know, a key factor uh, for, for the sport industry. Absolutely, absolutely uh, is, is a key factor. And uh, how do you do is uh, by, by mapping uh, the touch points, of course, and, uh, and trying to influence somehow the final decision uh, toward uh, let's say w- toward uh, a fan centric approach, can I say that? Um, which shall be holistic. Uh, you have to have the entire picture. You have to be omnichannel to reach out to, to Ole that uh, is not uh, accustomed to go on the official website, but uh, rather uses apps and is happy to download the official app, or uh, um, to reach out uh, Jose who is um, uh, more of an Instagram user and so on. So you, you have to be all around. And then we probably reach uh, my, my father by, by providing the right information on the TV news. So, um, and then integrate and being in a seamless way uh, with the communication on the ground on the match day uh, with the, through the signage through uh, the volunteers, which are not only mine. There's a, there's a huge piece that is delivered by the whole city. So before getting in touch with the volunteers of the organization as a stakeholder, there's the other piece of the organization. So the, the, the event, the local organizing committee, we used to call it now the different mob models, but the concept is the same. Right. And, uh, and the whole city, which has its own volunteers and they have to provide the same level of information yeah, uh, and if they call, we call entrance entrance. You cannot call it gate because the gate is the turnstiles. So yeah. where is the gate? Uh, where is the entrance? Is uh, it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, I might send you all the way around the stadium, and this, the volunteer on the other side will send you back, and then is where the complaints uh, and the bad mood starts. Uh, and probably the next volunteer that is doing the right job is the one that gets uh, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the frustration of the volu- of the spectators sometimes. Yeah. No, so um, this is uh, this is uh, basically to answer your question. Ole. But again, I guess sort of like to to wrap up uh, in a sense in this topic too. And how do you see this sort of like impacting your role with, with being so close to sort of like the spectator services and and working with these major events on? On, on on this you know with a shift that is happening and i guess like spreading that message to you know your managers and the people around you to like how do we how do we cope with this situation like where does it 
where does it begin, you know, in a sense to like map this out? Um, it begins uh, in terms of time. Uh, it's uh, it's variable, depends uh, event to event. Uh, I mean, there was uh, there was some plans ready for for Tokyo, uh, and these have been totally revised, uh, probably, uh, uh, and uh, adding the COVID layer, let's say, operationally. That's how we call it. Um, and it's not only to be applied to the spectators; it's to be applied to staff and volunteers. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, uh, how, how do you map that? Uh, you, you basically start considering when does the journey start? Yeah. And for me, it starts when uh, someone somewhere, anywhere thinks, oh, there is this event, should I go? And that's the moment that the journey starts for me. He will mm. be looking for information and we better have this information ready, clear and very simple already since right. then tickets price ticket uh, availability uh, easy or 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 less easy uh, to travel in between home cities if the event is a, kind of, is a world cup or others um, and so on and so on and so on hotels price uh, th th there's a, lot, a huge amount of information of so that's when when it starts and it, yeah. they do not depend on you only Right. Uh, so if there's no direct flight from your country uh, to the country that is hosting the event, uh, you, you will have other challenges, for example. Yeah. Um, and the exchange rate and the actual political situation, economic situation, everything affects the decision at the end of the day. Uh, so we start from there and we map uh, all, the, all the touch points, digital and physical. And then there's, uh, it's not that it's all up to one person, one department, there's plenty of departments. Right. Uh, it can be more than 20 within one of the stakeholders. So multiply that to the three main stakeholders, yeah. event owner, event organizer, and the uh, whole city or host country, you have uh, at least uh, 50 departments to talk to, right. to integrate. And um, <laughs> you have to respect the law, of course. So the law, it's, it's the reference here. And the, those, uh, those, those that are changing constantly nowadays. So the difficulty in declaring, uh, you've seen it for Tokyo, you, we're seeing it in 12 different countries of this Eurocup. The, right. the 12 different approach to that. There's still three host countries that didn't declare if they're going to open to spectators or not. Uh, so all this said, it's, it's, it's extremely complex, yeah. but it's, it's teamwork. Indeed, you need so many expertise inside the team, the task force, uh, from communication to marketing, uh, the for engagement, uh, which is the link between the two, according to me, uh, because uh, you promote, uh, you engage through communication, but the concept is more, let's say, sometimes it's commercial lead, sometimes it's communication lead. Um, then services, so that's, uh, that's my role, the operational side, and then uh, the digital side, and everyone together has to work. And it's extremely complex, but it's possible. It takes years. <laughs> but right. In many cases, we only have weeks. Yeah, no, but it's uh, it, it just you know just showcases the scope you know that lies into you know dealing and and organizing a major event you know and and how many factors that 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 you know put, that comes into place with this and, and I mean like you you pretty much you know covered you you covered a lot of these areas on like where it ties in and things that you know people should have in mind but but if we sort of like you know look a little bit forward i guess and a little bit ahead and 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 try to like you know map down i guess in a sense for you know these kind of students that that wants to be part of some some major event maybe you know the next one maybe you know in the in the next few years and and i guess like what tips do you have for them and, and what are some of the things that they should keep in mind with the current situation and where things are going both on the spectator side but also with the the requirements you know that are happening now uh, on health side and, and and so forth like how can they you know prepare in the best possible way i guess in a sense the way it is right now like what would be some of your tips that you have for them well first of all uh Think, uh, think what uh, the, the best uh, uh, course, because you, you are lucky enough to have 
a huge amount of options nowadays yeah. uh, among uh, prestigious universities. Right. Um, so uh, that's uh, probably we the, the, the first generation of uh, um, professional uh, sport managers is being educated uh, in uh, in this uh, in this decade um, uh, because yeah what we said um, given uh, said that uh, uh, volunteering uh, we, we mentioned is absolutely an opportunity you will learn a lot and you will have fun a lot you will have you have the opportunity to travel uh, once things uh, get better but you have opportunity to volunteer I'm not, you don't need to volunteer for the olympics of course uh, you're more than welcome but there's community events i mean uh, the the level of events uh, believe me you might learn more in a community local event rather than a, than a bigger event because it's more let's say the specialized roles uh, while in a smaller event you do you do more things uh, it depends uh, it depends on your attitude right uh, and by being curious of course yeah. always be curious read uh, there's uh, there's even uh, there's some academic studies nowadays uh, uh, around sport management uh, but without going to the academic level this this news all day long that you can relate and put together analyze that will help you to um, have a clear picture of what the business is about, be ready to sacrifice. Use uh, the use of LinkedIn for me is essential nowadays. For our business, sport business, LinkedIn is extremely important. It's very very used, and it links uh, professionals from all over the world, uh, and can put you in contact with me. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I'm very very open. I love uh, to to talk. You can tell, but to be in contact and to to share experience, uh, if I can inspire, I'm happy. But be sure, I, I can assure you, I will learn also uh, from from. I'm learning a lot from students. There's some students that are volunteering to help me developing um, a, a course that uh, that I'm working on, right? Uh, in Brazil and in other countries, um, and uh, have a critical thinking. Mm. Um, uh, there's there's a lot to be improved. Yep. So don't take things for granted uh, and be sure it will be very hard to keep, uh, to enter, it will be hard. But it will be probably harder to be in after your first event because you're not an expert yet. Uh, and uh, you did it in your country, most probably, if you worked. Uh, and the next one will be abroad, most probably. So try to gain as much as experience as possible to work on relations in the proper way, not showing off what you are not, because this will come out in the long way, in the long term, uh, and develop a strong emotional intelligence. This is, uh, this is extremely important as a soft skill more and more, uh, because um, this uh, will, will help you to empathize with colleagues, because we all think uh, that our job is the most important, but if we approach the colleagues, we're not able to do anything. I told you how many stakeholders uh, we have only in my area, I think uh, every other has its own. Yeah. Then uh, you need to, to empathize with a lot of people and to understand that a very good idea sometimes uh, is not a very good idea, it's not the time. There's another way to, to approach it or to mention it uh, or to plan for it. So be strategic, but above all, and I think this is the common denominator of all the figures we spoke about, the professionals, the volunteers, the fans, spectators, and the students. Passion. Passion. And sport. At the, end of, at the end of the day, this is what sport is about. Passion, because it's also related to the athletes. Without passion, they will never, they will never be a professional indeed. They will never reach uh, right. uh, results, great results. They will never exceed. Uh, the limit uh, the, they will never break a record or win a gold medal yeah the, the the passion is the foundation and and i mean like it just goes back to you know your story in the beginning about people right and how you have to communicate with these kind of people and whatever kind of position or role you're in you have to deal with people and and that's i guess should be you know one of the, the the greatest priorities and in a sense like a very important lesson like being able to deal with people 
and I guess like now as, as well, like one way is of course digitally, but physically as well, you know, being present and, and, and like you said, you put yourself in, you know, all these kind of different peoples and their shoes and, and how can you help out? How can you contribute? Right. Because you're here to learn, you're here to, you know, be part of the journey, but, but, but yeah, I mean, like utilizing the time to reach out to Marco, to, to other people that has been part of the game to, to, to get their insights, because that's, what's going to help you uh, realizing, you know, as well, the requirements and, and what it takes. And I mean, like it, it's been, a, it's, I think we had a great conversation already with a, with a lot of different touch points. And I guess like we could probably gone really far in some of them as well. And just, you know, dig, dig really deep, but, but Marco, I don't know if you have any like final, final remarks before we wrap up. Uh, uh, my my final my final remark. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's it's toward you, Ole. Uh, I I really appreciate and I'm thankful for this uh, invitation. I'm I'm following your podcast, and there's uh, there's a very very high level uh, guests. Uh, so I'm just uh, I cannot be more. I feel honored to be one of your guests, and uh, the, your project sporting lab is. Uh, is absolutely extremely interesting and uh, I'm sure it will continue shining more and more. Um, overall, um, I think we said a lot and we went uh, deep uh, deep in, in many in, in many aspects. Uh, I do not want to, to give uh, the impression that uh, the, the physical experience is the only one. Nowadays we have opportunities to provide a digital experience and uh, to be present on a 24 hours basis, seven days a week, uh, providing experiences uh, and therefore um, creating uh, or deepening that emotional connection, creating new opportunities that sports should approach in a fan-centric way. So my final remark would be, uh, yes, um, we're talking about sport and the raw material for sure are the athletes. But if we talk about sport business, the raw materials are two and the other is called fans. Right. And the fans uh, uh, deserve for all the passion, for all that love that they share with, uh, with their team, with their athletes, etc. They deserve some uh, attention, more attention from the sport organizations in general. So this is the way forward. This is what we should all work for the way back. Let's surprise the fans once they'll be back, especially those that have been loyal after right. one year without having a physical relation. If we relate that to a human being, I mean, how many uh, loyal uh, partners do we find without, uh, after one year without uh, uh, the physical touch point uh, in, uh, in a relation? Right. So those that have been loyal, well, those deserve something, uh, something special when they, I don't know, when your girlfriend comes back after a trip, you better buy flowers, don't you? <laughs> or when your man is back as well, eh? gender right. equality in all senses. 100%. Well, with that, Mark, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time to share your story and, and being part with you here us today. And if, like I said, for those of you that, you know, been staying here for the entire episode, you know, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to this, this channel, you know, and, and sign up at sportingglobal.com if you haven't already, you know, connect with Marco, connect with other people as well, and, and see if there are any cool opportunities out there in the job market. And then you'll, you know, use, use this time now to reflect you know to think and and see okay how can i make an impact on on the sports fans or or any other way that you think you know to be part of this amazing industry that we all love so much so marco thank you thank you once again for taking the time and uh, with every every video podcast we do we always finish with some Norwegian so I'll, I'll, I'll teach you some Norwegian this time as well which is uh snakkes which means see you later in Norwegian Bisnakis. There you go. Perfect. Look at that. All right. Thank you so much, Marco, and we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much, Oleo. So. <laughs>